started to uh, hear the drums and the music. I was getting ready to get into it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, my, as my my ace Coon Boone uh, mentioned, um, this has been a this powerful experience in the spirit. Amen. Amen. To to be here with an extension of Dr. Martin Luther King Amen. and Congressman Lewis. Dr. William B. McLean. Dr. McLean is, he's not just a professor to us. He's, he's a spiritual father to my wife and I. He has meant so much to us and to our ministry. And it's not just, it's not just Dr. McLean alone, amen? amen. It, like us, uh, he, he and his wife provide a wonderful example of, of a marriage and ministry and how we're to love one another, amen? Amen. amen. I've been inspired uh, over the last few minutes or so, as many of you have, to, um, I'm going to be giving a word today, but the word um, has changed. Amen? Let me start off with reading a scripture, and the scripture is apropos to all that we're going through and, and dealing with in today's times, while standing on the shoulders of giants in order to overcome. Let me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, just one verse. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. The title that I will speak to you from today is Now We Have the Gas. What are we going to do with it? The sacrificial solution that will heal institutional sin, such as oppression and poverty and random violence, is at the very foundation of our existence. It is the most powerful thought ever conceived. It is simultaneously a noun, a verb, a, a pronoun, an adverb, an, an adjective, a preposition, a conjunction, and God's expectation of his creation. It is the very nucleus of, of who God is and what God does and what God desires. And the solution is the central and unending presence of one word, my brothers and sisters. Love. Webster's Dictionary has both a, a conditional and anemic definition of love. It says that love is a, a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or, or personal ties. Like maternal love for a child, which is a Greek term, storge. It says that love is attraction based on sexual desire or affection and tenderness felt by lovers, which is the Greek term eros. And lastly, it says that love is affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interest, such as friendship and family, which is the Greek term philia. But at best, Webster's Dictionary is myopic. It places love in a box of circumstantial dependence and conditional limitation. It is not reflective of love in the context of the almighty God. You see, God's love, it, it knows no limitations. God's love cannot be placed in a box. God's love is compassionate. It's tough. It's patient. It's persevering. It's selfless. It's, it's suffering. And I, I, I tell you, God's love is always victorious. God's love allows us to, to transform. It allows us to take those things that we can't see happening and to, to resurrect. God's love restores. God's love will never, ever fail us. You see, like Webster, we, we the church must be careful not to create an, an inadequate and convenient and comfortable definition of God's love. 
See, for if Webster took the time to truly and, and accurately address the definition of, of God's love, that one definition by itself would be infinite in length. That definition would be as extensive as the entire dictionary and would describe every combination and permutation of the cross. See, for God's love is the Greek word agape. It is, it is karitas or unconditional. It is absolute. It is eternal. It is holistic and it is complete. God's love is not a weak. It's not a weak, passive love. It is love in action, always seeking to preserve community, no matter the circumstance. It is an adaptive theology of positive social change. It is a global revolution of corrective morality. It is justification and declaration of peaceful and compassionate war against those oppressive activities that are antithetical to love through peaceful confrontation. God's love stretches out and touches the pathos, the deeper water, those that seem unreachable and untouchable. You see, embedded with God's love is the Greek term thelema, which means that God desires that we, those who, who are made in the image of God, the imago Dei, reciprocate God's love and, and share it with one another no matter the circumstance. But how long will it be before we come together through faith and courage to cross the, the Edmund, Edmund Prattis Bridge of the 21st century? How long will we sit back and watch innocent children being slaughtered in our suburbs and in our cities? How long will we confront not just the symptoms of violence but also the causes of the violence? How long will we allow poverty to grip the throat of our existence? How long will we ignore the realities of digital secularization and global urbanization or the new internet city? When the homeless come and, and the sick cry out and the poor reach out and the corrupt infiltrate and hate threatens beloved community, you see, my brothers and sisters, we must ask ourselves the question, individually and collectively, are we the Christian servants of social change or should they look for another? When the remnant comes seeking the collective sacrifice that God expected from each and every one of us before time existed, will our collective cross be vacant? Why is there silence? Where is the prophetic voice? Where is the prophetic voice and action of the church? Are we the Christians healing mom or should they look for another? Now is the time to show the NRA what God's love looks like. Now is the time to heal the sick, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry. Now is the time to demand loving action from our politicians. Now is the time for transparent dialogue with Fortune 500 organizations that finance the prison industrial complex. Now is the time, my brothers and sisters, to be the church. The world needs the church. The church can no longer wait as there is rapidly growing evil. There are still children out there starving. There are still homeless right outside of this building waiting. There is still abusive oppression waiting to be confronted by God's servants through the power and unction of the Holy Spirit that rests within you. Now is the time for a theology of social change. See, a theology of social change was the four-step nonviolent approach taken during the Montgomery 
bus boycott with Dr. Martin Luther King. A theology of social change was reflected through the action of the nuns who, who lived in AIDS hospices in Manhattan in the early 1980s. And I remember these nuns loved and cleaned the, the blood and pus-filled wounds of those left behind by AIDS. At a time when society was terrified more by the possibility of contamination than by the possibility of sacrificial reconciliation. A theology of social change was the Amish community in, in Nicoma Mines, Pennsylvania in 2006 that personally lost so much in the senseless murder of loved ones, including children. And yet they forgave the gunman and extended sincere, tender compassion to the gunman's family. A theology of social change is not easy, for it requires the strength and perseverance to break through the digital tomb of despair facing the church. My brothers and sisters, how long will the dead in spirit remain incarcerated in a tomb? How long will we, the striving remnant, those seeking eternal life, be confined to a spiritual tomb? How long will it be before we, we the church, begin to take down strongholds once and for all to boldly overcome the oppression of our spirit from our flesh? For when they betrayed Jesus and beat him, and dragged him through the streets. And they spit on him and they called him names. Because he was the word that was there in the beginning with God and who had come to save the world. You see, his disposition could not be controlled by the impending and sure reality of a tomb. And so he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because he was there in the garden in the beginning during the Edenic covenant and in the Old Testament finally on the cross. When the soldiers divided the garments and, and pressed thorns in his skull and cast lots for his belongings. He could not be confined to a tomb of bitterness. He said, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. Because he was there during the Abrahamic and Noahic and, and Mosaic covenants in the Old Testament. On the cross when the thief asked him to be removed from the tomb of unforgiveness. Rather than eternal condemnation, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say today, to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Because he was there during the Palestinian and Davidic and New Covenants where he wrote upon our hearts, my brothers and sisters. While on the cross, in excruciating pain, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple John, whom he loved standing, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Woman, he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took to her into his home. You see, in that moment, Jesus showed us who are willing to stand and trust him and to walk in the fire that neither death nor life no angel, no principality, no power. No things present, no things to come. No height, no death, no any other created thing. Shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And because he was there with the children of Israel. Throughout their disobedience and wilderness experiences. To witness and receive their, their burnt offerings and, and their grain offerings and their meal offerings and their fellowship offerings. And peace offerings and sin offerings and trespass offerings. We're always making an offering. After saving the soul of a paralytic and then healing, not because of their faith, but because they were willing to carry their brother through the roof. After manifesting the Holy Spirit that indwelled within him to feed 5,000 souls. After teaching the disciples to, to walk on water, if that is what they were required to do. After giving a blind man sight, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and saying, Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. 
My brothers and sisters, in that very moment, in that last breath, when, when death looked final, when all of the offerings and sacrifices from the Old Testament combined, Jesus, the incarnate word of God, made flesh, relinquished the divine power of the Holy Spirit to give the ultimate sacrifice, to absorb every tomb and every sin for all humankind forever. At that awesome, amazing, wonder-working moment, the blueprint and foundation for a theology of social change was established for us all. Martin walked into that gas station when he didn't have to. He stepped into what looked like certain death. He was in a Peter situation. He was in a Paul and Silas situation. It was not Martin that spoke to the man. It was a God through Martin that spoke to the man. Each one of you are a derivative of Martin. The prophetic voice in the 21st century cannot stay silent. We no longer live in broken cities. We live in a digitized secularization, a global urbanization. In the, in the moment, there can be an uprising. An uprising that changes an entire continent. But if we are not central and present, if the word of God is not central and present in the midst of the new city, then there will be calamity. Will you join me today with Restore Together?